Hello, today we're going to talk about how to detect silent machine learning failures in models deployed to production. So you can treat this presentation as kind of an introduction to machine learning monitoring. My name is Wojtek Kuberski and I'm a co-founder of NaniML. NaniML is an open source Python library for machine learning monitoring, for detecting silent machine learning failure and for doing data drift detection. So let's get started with the agenda. So uh, first thing we're going to talk about are two main reasons why machine learning models can fail. And these reasons are data drift and concept. We're going to define what are they and how they can potentially impact performance. Then we're going to talk about how to and the most important thing, which is trying to see what's the performance of your model. And we're going to talk why you need to do performance estimation and why simply calculating performance is most often not possible because you do not have access to targets once you deploy your models to production, or at least you don't have full immediate access to target data after you deploy your models. And then we're going to talk about, about kind of the root cause analysis or the reasons uh, why machine learning models can fail. And we're going to talk about uh, the ways to pinpoint really what actually changed, what went wrong. So we're going to talk about data and concept drift detection. Uh, so before we jump into that, let's set the stage with a very simple use case. So we're going to talk about a lone default prediction use case, which is a typical use case in banks when you're just trying to do a binary classification, whether a person is going to default or not. We're going to take the credit scores, we're going to take the customer information, and based on that, we're trying to predict whether a person has, uh, is going to default on a loan or not. So we deploy this model to production. Once we did that, we want to know whether this model is still performing well, whether the predictions are reliable, and how. Uh, if something goes wrong, we want to know that it went wrong and why it went wrong. And we're going to use as our target non-payment within one year, so we'll have to wait a year until and the target is available. And as our technical metric, we're going to use ROC AUC, which is a very typical metric in binary classification models. So uh, now uh, let's start defining uh, two main ways that machine learning models can fail, or two main reasons, which is concept drift and data drift. And before we do that, we need to look at what we're actually trying to do when we train our machine learning models. So, Let's start with the true pattern that exists in reality. Here, you, as an example, you could see that there is some kind of variable x, and as this x increases, the chance uh, that a given data point is going to belong to negative class also increases in kind of sigmoidal fashion. So we have this true pattern that exists in reality, some kind of relationship that might or might not be causal. It doesn't really matter. And then we're going to sample from this population of people according to that pattern, because this pattern exists in reality. Uh, so then we're going to get our data and this is really the data that we're going to use. We're going to split it into our training, validation, test set. Maybe we'll do some cross validation. doesn't really matter. And this is the data that we will use to develop our model, test our model. And now let's see what happens if there is data drift. How the true pattern, the sampling and the data is affected and how performance might potentially be affected. So. Uh, in case of data drift or covariate shift, as it's also known, the true pattern remains unchanged. So there is the thing that we're trying to recapture this pattern has not changed at all. It is more or less exactly the same if we're dealing only with the covariate shift. However, what changes is the sampling. So we sample from this pattern in a slightly different way. So the distribution of the inputs will change, but the way the inputs actually relate to the target will remain the same. To, to define it a bit more formally, uh, data drift or covariate shift is change in joint model input distribution. And again, here we see that uh, the distribution of x is changes, uh, but again, the pattern still, still stays the same. And if data drift happens or covariate shift happens, uh, it may or may not impact performance. One example when will impact performance is imagine that uh, this data drifts to a region when it's harder to distinguish between the positive and the negative class. So close to the class boundary, let's say the real class boundary that uh, really um, separates the positive from negative classes. There, because of a bit of noise, it's going to be very hard to distinguish for the model or for anyone else uh, whether the point should belong to a negative or positive class. So we expect the performance of the model to drop. And however, if the data drifts into regions that where the model is even more certain of the predictions than before, then we could even see increase in model performance. 
and data drift is something that tends to happen quite often so we should be able to somehow capture the impact of data drift on performance but more on that later uh, now let's look at the second reason why the performance might change and this reason is concept drift. so in that case what changes is the true pattern so we see that this kind of sigmoidal shape and uh, the relationship between and uh, the feature x and the frequency of positive and negative classes is going to be different so the pattern that we're trying to capture that we learned with our machine learning models is actually now different it's no longer the same uh, now maybe the pattern is much more linear than sigmoidal if we deal with pure concept drift without the covariate shift our sampling is not going to be changed and in that case of course our data is going to look differently not from the input perspective but from the target distribution perspective and again let's define it more formally so concept drift is just the change in the underlying concept or pattern or mapping between the target and the model input so it's the probability of the target given the inputs and here uh, just to again visualize quickly we see that in training data we'll have that kind of true boundary so this is not about the learned boundary but about true boundary and in production data we'll have something completely different and in that case uh, the performance of the model of course would not be uh, as good as it used to be because the learned pattern is no longer the same as the real pattern so concept drift will almost always impact performance and the stronger the concept drift is the stronger its impact on performance is going to be and so i mentioned performance quite a few times now so now let's talk why we should really focus on it so first of all just detecting data drift is not enough because it does not always lead to performance just the existence of data drift is not a strong signal or signal at all for the change in performance another reason is that performance is something that we optimize in training we use it as a business impact proxy and of course the business impact proxy is uh, something that's very important to us because as data scientists our job is to maximize business impact with data with machine learning use cases so now that we know what are the reasons why performance can degrade and why we know why performance is really important let's talk about how we can actually monitor performance and the main thing is we'd like to simply calculate the performance so we'd like to take the ground truth or the target data and comparative predictions and then we compute our f1 our rock ac and uh, whatever metric you like and uh, the, the problem with that is most of the time we actually do not have access to target data and uh, and the reasons are really threefold when we look at the prediction use cases so the use cases in which we are trying to mm, predict something in the future uh, the target data will be delayed and it's going to be more delayed the more far away in the future we try to predict something if we're trying to predict default or on a mortgage we might actually define it from business perspective as non-payment within three five years that means that we'll only get our target data in five years from now so we'll be really like flying blindly for five years which is not acceptable level of risk for most businesses and especially use cases that have huge impact on the business like credit loan default prediction and um, another reason why we cannot simply calculate performance is that in some of these cases we do not have a complete label so again just to give you continue with the example of and um, the credit scoring uh, we know for every person that we gave the loan to so we, we predicted that this person is not going to default we gave a negative prediction for each of these people we know whether we defaulted or not so we can tell whether our negatives were true negatives or false negatives however if we if our model predicts that the person is going to default on the loan so we have a positive prediction then we will not be able to really tell whether they would have uh, paid back their loans if we had given it to them so we do not have access to complete labels to every single label we, and we cannot reconstruct the confusion matrix and there are methods that deal with that like reject reference but they still do not provide full picture of all the labels all the targets that we have and then uh, kind of looking at this from a different perspective if we consider the automation use cases when instead of predicting something in the future we're really trying to automate some kind of most menial labor that is done by humans in that case uh, getting all the labels would kind of defeat the purpose of uh, of the use case because we would have to redo uh, every single prediction manually and that just doesn't make any sense so 
most of the time we will get some kind of spot checks when humans will double check a machine's predictions but this most of the time happens for around one percent of the data so for ninety nine percent of our predictions we will not have the labels so we do not have access to ground truth and simply calculating performance is not going to be the answer for our monitoring needs most of the time so what we need to do instead is we need to estimate performance and the way to do it is really looking at how the model really evaluates its own confidence and then try to somehow um, transform it into expected performance. And before we go deeper, uh, I just mentioned that this is an algorithm that we've developed in-house at NaniML and it's part of our open source package. And what we're trying to do really is trying to capture the impact of data drift on performance. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the model scores, so predicted probabilities. We're going to make sure that these predicted probabilities actually represent the probability that a given uh, row or given uh, person uh, belongs to positive or negative class. And then we're going to try to uh, transform that into expected uh, performance. Uh, so first, let's start with taking probabilities, so taking the model scores and making sure that they actually represent probabilities. So to do that, we need to calibrate the probabilities. And probability calibration is a technique when we're trying to make sure, or we're actually fitting another model that adjusts model scores so that if you bucket your data uh, according to quantiles between, let's say, 0% to 10% chance or 0.0 to 0.1, etc., you want to know that the data in this bucket actually has the corresponding chance uh, that uh, it is a positive or negative class. So to simplify, let's say that you have uh, 100 predictions uh, where they, uh, the prediction that model score is around 0 0.9. And what we want to ensure is that this 0 0.9 actually means that 90% of those 100 predictions will be positive. So what we expect from a well-calibrated probability is that this probability actually gives you the chance that uh, a given data point is positive or negative. Now, if we have that, another thing that we need to do is the threshold. So in most of the use cases, we need to at some point, classification use cases, we need to at some point threshold our data. Let's say we threshold at 0 0.5, and then we treat everything above 0 0.5 as a positive prediction, everything below 0 0.5 as a negative prediction. So now we're going to take our uh, data point and we're going to look at the calibrated probability, let's say it's 0 0.9, and we're going to compare it to our threshold, let's say it's 0 0.5. And then what we'll see that this is going to be a positive prediction and we know, because the probabilities are calibrated, that there is a 90% chance that this is going to be a true positive prediction, that the uh, that prediction actually will turn out to be positive with 90% probability. So what we will do then is we're going to construct a partial confusion matrix and we'll put 0 0.9 in the true positive cell. Then we're going to take 0 0.1 and we're going to put it in the false positive cell because there is a 10% chance that it is a positive prediction, but it's false because 1 minus 0 0.9 chance that it's positive and 0 0.1 the chance that it's negative. So we'll have 0 0.1 in the false positive cell. And we'll have this partial confusion matrix for uh, just one data point. Then we're going to take a look at all data points in our period that we want to analyze and calculate performance for. Let's say it's last day or last week. And we're going to do the same process for every one of them. And then we're going to sum these partial confusion matrices. And what we're going to end up with is expected confusion matrix according to the model itself. So the model kind of gives us its own estimate of how well it thinks it performs uh, on a specific data set. And this really takes into account the change in uh, model input distribution, because imagine, like you see here, that in the picture on the left, let's say that's our training data, we don't really have a lot of uh, data points close to the class boundary where the model is not confident. And on the right, we will see way more data points next to the class boundary. So the model is going to be less confident there and the performance is expected to be lower. And this algorithm and the simple transformation really 
fully takes into account the impact of data drift on performance. And just to give you a quick example of how it works in practice, uh, we took California housing data set, which is a data set that most of you are familiar with. Uh, we thresholded it, turned it into binary classification problem for simplicity, and we compared our estimated row KUC with realized row KUC. And as you can see, it fits quite well um, with each other. So now we know how to estimate performance uh, if we can calculate it. But we don't really know what is the reason why the performance has decreased because this method is not very interpretable. So then we need to go back to data drift detection and see what data drifted um, in a way that impacted performance. So then we can figure out actually how to troubleshoot it and how to resolve the problems. So then we're going to look at data drift detection or covariate shift detection. And there's two ways to do that. The first one is univariate, when we'll just look at uh, things of like KS test or chi square test, and we will compare the distribution before and after uh, change. So we'll look at our reference data set when we know everything's fine. And we're going to look at our analysis data set when uh, we would like to know whether there's significant data drift and we'd like to figure out whether a specific feature actually drifted. So we're going to look at every feature separately. And this uh, technique is great for interpretability because you will know exactly every single feature that drifted. However, it has two big drawbacks. The first one is that if you have a lot of features, let's say 200 or 100 features, you will get a lot of false positives because things will just randomly change all the time and it doesn't mean that these changes actually impact performance. And secondly, uh, the univariate data drift detection or uh, covariate shift detection methods do not really take into account change in the relationships between the model inputs. So let's say that the correlation between two features changes, but the distribution of these features on from univariate perspective does not change. In that case, we will not be able to capture this data drift. So because of these two reasons, we normally turn to a bit more advanced method when we look at all the features at once or a subset of features at once, and we're going for multivariate covariate shift detection or data detection, and we're going to use an algorithm uh, called data reconstruction. So what we're going to do here is we're going to compress the data via some dimensionality reduction method that learns the structure of the data. Then we're going to do an inverse transform and we're going to reconstruct the data. Then we're going to compare the, all the points in the original data with the points in the reconstructed data. And we're going to measure the dislocation between these two points. And this dislocation uh, kind of gives us information of how good the compressor is. If the compressor was perfect. Uh, we would see that the original data and reconstruction and constructed data is exactly the same. And because this compressor is learned on the structure of the data, we're going to train this compression on our reference data set. And then we're going to do this compression decompression on our analysis data set. And um, that will tell us how strongly the uh, structure of the data has changed looking at the, the error that we see between the, the original and reconstructed data. So here we will just plot this error in time. If this error increases, we have data drift. And we should start by looking at the data drift at all features at once. And then if we see that there is data drift for certain region, we should look at it for sets of features. That will give us a quite comprehensive way of looking whether there is data drift or not. And it will give us a bit of interpretability because we'll know which subset of features has drifted or how the uh, uh, relationships between features are changing. And if the reconstruction are still the same, it's all good. The structure of the data is likely to be very similar. And if the reconstruction are actually decreases, that means that the learned structure of the data is, uh, uh, the, sorry, the real structure of the data is getting more and more similar to the learned structure which means that there's also data drift, but in some ways in an opposite direction. And I mentioned that we need to use some kind of encoding or some kind of compression or some kind of uh, dimensionality reduction method. And uh, we're using PCA in, uh, in the library, but it in principle needs to be any kind of encoding that learns the internal structure of the data, reduces the dimensionality, provides an in inverse transformation, and provides latent structure that maps in a stable way to the original space. And this last requirement is really needed so that we can use this reconstruction error as a measure of the magnitude of the data drift. So the stronger the reconstruction error is, the stronger the data drift. 
and this reconstruction error can be any metric that basically looks at the distance we're just looking at the mean of euclidean distance and again uh, i'm going to give you a quick example of how this works in practice so imagine that you have here an example with uh, points in blue which is our reference data set for which we know everything is fine and then we have uh, points in orange for which we really don't know what's going on and if we do our uh, simple univariate data drift detection on both of these features x and y we will actually not see any changes however if we do a pca reconstruction error multiple uh, drift detection we will see that the data reconstruction actually spikes very strongly after uh, the um, the distribution changes so we are able to capture this change in correlation between features even if distribution per feature on the feature level does not change so now let's quickly summarize uh, so first and foremost um, data drift and concept drift are the main reasons why uh, performance can drop and the data drift does not always lead to performance uh, then we'd like to monitor that performance since we cannot just monitor data drift but production targets are often not available so we cannot simply calculate so we need to uh, do performance estimation without the target data um, using uh, an algorithm that uh, I explained using uh, confidence-based performance estimation and only then we should go back to data drift detection to figure out what actually happened if performance drops and that's really it so thanks for listening and feel free to check our github as I mentioned we're open source and if you like what you see there uh, do give us a star also feel free to visit our website and if you have any specific questions uh, you can ask them now in the Q&A session or add me on LinkedIn later on. Thank you very much. That's it.